How wonderful has it been to see the Lord work in tremendous ways. How he has answered so many prayers favorably. At the beginning of February, churches were still not permitted to gather. But during the week of our launch, the Lord lifted that restriction. And we had our very first service on the 7th of February, 2021. And we have continued to meet ever since. And we've seen the Lord bless us with many new faces. He's blessed us with many dear friendships. We've seen the Lord saving some. And we've seen the Lord sanctifying others. Many of us have wept together. Many of us have rejoiced together. Many of us have celebrated special occasions with one another. And we have grown in our relationships with each other and with the Lord. If I were to describe Livingstone with one word, which would be very difficult, I mean, surely it would have to be Christ or Jesus, who is the, the living stone. But as I consider this body of believers that the Lord has brought together here to Livingstone Bible Church, what comes to my mind is joy. When I step back and behold all that the Lord has done in and through so many of you, I'm filled with joy because I see Christ in you who is your joy. Sundays at Livingstone Bible Church is indeed my favorite day of the week. The day where my family and I gather with the Livingstone family to worship Christ together corporately. There is no greater day than today, the Lord's Day. As a church, we have so much to be thankful for. And so please don't forget to frequently offer up your prayers of thanksgiving for all that the Lord is doing in and through this body. Thank Jesus, who is the head of this church. It is he who planted this church. It is he who will sustain this church. And it is he who will use this church to accomplish his plan of redemption in this period of church history. His plan of redemption within this community and all around the world. But let's not take this joy for granted and forget that churches often go through struggles, even good churches. What may seem to be an ideal, harmonious situation on the surface may in fact disguise a congregation wrestling with the question of mission, belief, leadership. Sometimes it's more oblivious, outright conflict. As pastors, and I think even as Christians by and large as a whole, we often fantasize of the New Testament era and its churches. We wonder how amazing it might have been to be in the Apostle Paul's church. Or to be in one of the churches that the Apostle John pastored. However, as we read the New Testament, one soon realizes that the congregations that Paul pastored faced major external pressure. A synagogue, perhaps much like those in Antioch of Pisidia or Iconium, they gave Paul's followers much trouble. Or perhaps it was a rival denomination, like the Judaizers, who plagued the Galatian church with profound heresy, pouncing upon that church. But the church in the New Testament era didn't only struggle externally, but it struggled internally too. There were significant portions of the congregation who revolted. There were failed, disqualified leaders. There were elders who challenged the authority of the pastor. There was much confusion about Christian faith and Christian practice. The church in Corinth had problems of leadership and mission. The church in Philippi not only faced hostile persecution, 
but also its members were at one another's throats, living selfishly, arguing aggressively, barely exhibiting the character of Christ. The New Testament leaves no doubt that Paul had churches that were engaged in extremely destructive behavior. And the churches that, that John pastored, they were no different. In each of his letters, particularly in 1 John, his first letter, it is evident that those churches faced severe difficulty. It was several years of difficult pastoral leadership. 1 John 2, verses 18 and 19, suggests that the church who received his first letter had even split. Some members had left their congregations in uproar. John described them as antichrists. But the trouble didn't stop there. These disgruntled former members, they still had a pull on the church. And as one commentator writes, they were playing heavy-handed politics. They were cajoling, persuading John's faithful members to come away and join the revolt. John spared no words in criticizing such people. In 1 John 3 verse 10, he calls them children of the devil. One pastor wrote, recently I attended a men's retreat thinking that most of the participants would be laymen of our church. But sitting across me from that, on that very first morning was a minister from a mainline denomination, an ex-minister, should I say, who had been run out of his church, to use his words, because a circle of elders claiming to have been inspired by the Spirit had challenged his authority and demolished his ministry. They came to know new things about the Lord Jesus and about the Spirit. And through their persuasive abilities, they had won the bulk of the congregation. And the pastor had become a casualty of the many lethal skirmishes that went on week after week. Sure, sometimes I wonder, why am I in pastoral ministry? Conflict and struggle are no stranger in the, in the first letter of John. They were no stranger to the churches that John planted and was pastoring. It was written in the, in the midst of much controversy. John writes this letter to a group of broken churches, hurting churches, doubting, struggling churches. He writes to give guidance, pastoral counsel, instruction of what should be normal Christian thought, normal Christian behavior, especially when congregational life gets tough. But Pastor John wrote this letter to not only guide these hurting churches, but he also wrote this letter for us, 2,000 years that would follow. For you and I, so that we, with the help of Christ, would try to build a community of believers, a Christian community that John no doubt en envisaged. But what do we do when conflict rears its ugly head? What do the elders of Livingstone do when the members decide that the usual course of church life is no longer satisfying? What if the usual course of theological orthodoxy is regarded as archaic? What happens when dissents become uh, acerbic, biting, cutting, that inevitably splits the congregation. Well, Pastor John found himself in this exact situation. How do we confront those who teach error? How do we confront those who advocate wrong teaching 
which has been buttressed by claims of spiritual authority, spiritual inspiration, spiritual enlightenment. How can we sincerely, how can we equip sincere believers so that they wouldn't fall prey to charlatans who irresponsibly undermine pastoral authority, who twist the scriptures? John's opponents claim to be filled with the Spirit. And in fact, if one looks down the the course of church history, it is a sad truth that most heresies have arisen from within the church, often initiated by the leaders of the church. Let us not be hasty in laying on of hands, but being very careful about the leaders whom you recognize. Watch their life. Watch their doctrine closely. Many people claim to be Christians today, even declare that Jesus is the Son of God, but they have fallen trapped to the adoption of human wisdom, pragmatism. John's opponents would readily say, I am a Christian, but they put a spin on Christian doctrine that the Apostle John found utterly abhorrent, aberrant. What do we at Living Stone do if people live lives that make you wonder if the gospel has even touched their hearts? What if their behavior, their attitudes, or their ethical decisions are utterly foreign to being disciples of Jesus Christ? Does Christian faith require Christian conduct in order for it to be valid? Is it even appropriate to weigh the sincerity of someone's faith by looking at the way that he or she conducts himself or herself within the community and within the world? Is that even appropriate? John's opponents threatened his congregation. But didn't their behavior invalidate their claims to be Christian? If so, how do you and I identify such behavior without becoming legalists? First John tells us how. This was a very difficult period in Christian history when the boundaries of orthodoxy and heresy were unclear. There were no creeds. There was no collection of books that make up the New Testament, which of course could be used to arbitrate theological disputes. But John returns repetitively over and over again to two theological truths, two subjects, Christology, the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and ethical behavior, your conduct as believers. And the two are intimately connected. The the sessionists, those who had left the formal membership of those congregations, they had embraced an aberrant form of Christology, which led them into erroneous judgments about Christian living. Your understanding of Jesus will either lead you into full-tilt apostasy, or it will humble you into loving, obedient devotion. John's opponents, they denied Jesus as son. They denied Jesus Christ's incarnation, that he came in the flesh. They denied that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah. Confronting this Christological error, 1 John The apostle declares, Jesus is the Christ. Jesus has indeed come in the flesh. I saw him. I touched him. Jesus is the son. He is the son of God. Jesus came by water and by blood. John's opponents, they embraced a high Christology, which elevated Christ to divinity, but at the expense of his humanity. Docetism, docetism 
asserts that Christ may have appeared in the flesh, but in actuality, he didn't. Because to them, all that is material is sinful. To them, the notion that Christ appeared in the flesh was ludicrous at best, absolutely heretical at worst. But by denying the humanity of Christ, they denied an essential component of the gospel. I, Howard Marshall, describes them well. He writes, They were like men kicking away the ladder on which they have climbed to the heights and leaving themselves with any visible means of support. And kicked the chair from under their feet, hung themselves. These opponents asserted that they were spiritually inspired, having supposedly this new special revelation of Jesus Christ, about Christ. This was the early stages of Gnosticism which would be further fully developed in the second and third century. But it wasn't only their Christology, which was gravely erroneous, but also their moral disposition. John's opponents boasted, we have no sin. They boasted, we have fellowship with God, yet we walk in darkness. They boasted, we know God, but yet they lived in disobedience. They boasted, we love God, but they hated their brothers and sisters. They boasted, we are in the light, but they hated their fellow Christian. So the apostle John responds to their hypocrisy by saying to abide in God is to obey God. It is to walk as Jesus walked. To sin willfully shows that one doesn't know God. Whoever continues in sin as a pattern of his or her life belongs to the devil. He points out that we are called to love one another. And if you don't love your brother who you see, how can you love God whom you don't see? Saying that you love God but not your neighbor is a contradiction in terms. It means that one has not inherited eternal life. God is love, and we know Him. And if we know Him, we love Him. And to know Him is to love. John makes it very clear that a heretical Christology results in an unethical conduct. John's opponents had not only denied the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that he became flesh, but they also denied his earthly teachings. They denied all that Jesus had commanded. They didn't heed Jesus' words written in the gospel. Likewise, if they denied their own sinfulness, why would they need atonement? Why would they need Christ to die to pay sin's penalty? And instead of drawing near to wise, mature, godly Christians to seek their counsel, they were intolerant to them. They hated them. Their conflict conflict was as a result of their perceived spiritual superiority. Pastor John didn't only confront these secessionists, those that had left their formal membership, but he had also exhorted his church to love. Those who were truly in the faith, he exhorted them to love. Their love was of equal importance. How you respond to being sinned against, mistreated, hated, is just as important. It is critical. Just because their theology was right, by by no means did it give them license to justify their anger or their hostility. Growing up, my parents would often say, it takes two to fight. My sister and I fought often. It takes two to fight. But is it possible then for one person to be in sin and the other blameless? 
perhaps, but does it remain that way for very long? No. Inevitably, we too will sin. So what is the godly response to anger? Well, first, recognize your part in the problem. Confess your sin. Second, check your own desires, your own motives, and put on godly desires, godly motives. Thirdly, make sure that you're not taking revenge. Never seek revenge. Fourthly, speak the truth in love. Fifthly, remember that God is sovereign over your trial. Seek to use that offense as an opportunity for edification, for sanctification. Sixthly, be ready to forgive. And seventh and finally, what, should ought, to, what ought to characterize every step is trust in God and rely upon His resources. Trust in God and rely upon His resources. Despite His faithfulness, and despite the faithfulness of the core, the Johannine church did not survive the conflict. The church split with strong leaders taking the fellowship down the, down the road of Gnosticism and Docetism. While John's own disciples, they remained in community within the New Testament church, within churches that Paul had planted and other apostles. Did Pastor John hear, well done, my good and faithful servant? John had failed to build the church which we would esteem today. His congregations did not thrive, grow, or prosper. Paul and Barnabas, their church in Antioch, became a mega church. It was large, it was wealthy, influential, sending missionaries throughout the Mediterranean, even famous because of famous for their biblical scholars like Diodore and Lucian who were hailed from Antioch. For 600 years until the conquest of the Umayyad Muslims, Antioch gave theological and pastoral leadership to the Christian world. No such claim could be made of John's career, of the churches that John planted and pastored. The Johannine community disappeared in hist into history. No heritage, no fame. But before Christ, whom he served, John was indeed a faithful pastor. He was a pastor who found himself navigating his congregation through an impossible storm. And as his community was hit by wave after wave after wave, he distinguished his leadership with discretion and good judgment. And with the help of the Spirit and through the studying of the Scriptures, John cultivated a sound theology which enabled him to press through, to endure through those trials, those attacks that he was facing. To endure in the midst of the battle, to carry on. He knew exactly which issues were of utter essential importance to the faith, that which was a priority. He knew where he could not compromise. He also had phenomenal insight as to what made for a vital Christian community. The last thing that John wanted was orthodoxy without love. The last thing he wanted was the church to be spiritual but misrepresent Christ. He wanted both sound doctrine and vibrant community. John was a faithful pastor because he knew how to stand firm in what was essential. 
He had sincere compassion for his congregations, which burned, that compassion burned just as intensely as his anger towards those who sought to make them pray. In one breath, he speaks to his little children, and then he chastises his opponents, calling them children of the devil. This is the historical context and introductory overview of the first letter of John. However, for the purpose of to further understand the context, it is important that you understand and seek to get the answers to four very important questions. One, who wrote it? Two, when was it written? Three, who received this letter? And four, why was it written? Kiddies, these are easy questions to answer. You've got your kids' worksheets. Who wrote the first letter of John? It was John, the apostle. God, by the, the Holy Spirit, moved the apostle John so that through him and without violating his own personality, he without error composed and recorded this first letter, which was, God, the God's, it was God's divine canonical message to these churches. And it is just as applicable to us today. This leads us then to the second question. When was it written? The Apostle John was an old man. He was a seasoned pastor. And he wrote this letter around A.D. 90 to 95, somewhere within that period. A.D. 90 to 95, at the end of the, the first century. The next question we need to understand is, who received this letter? Who received it? Well, the Apostle John, when he penned this letter, he was in Ephesus at the time. And he wrote this letter to several churches, which he planted and was pastoring in Asia Minor, now modern-day Turkey. Now, fourth and finally, why? Why did he write this letter? And I think you know why. I've just spent a significant amount of time helping you understand the historical context, some of the theological battles he was facing, the threats from within. We've also spent some time considering some of the contents, the literary context. Why was it written? Why did the seasoned pastor write First John? Well, Pastor John wrote this first letter to provide a series of spiritual tests to determine and describe true Christianity. He wrote this letter to provide a series of spiritual tests to determine and describe true Christianity. These tests not only helped counter the false teaching of this incipient Gnosticism, but passing these tests provided the basis for fellowship among professing Christians and assurance of eternal life in God. He wrote this letter so that those doubting Christians who had been so confused by the false teachings of these false teachers that they might have their assurance of salvation restored. Turn in your Bibles to 1 John 5, verse 13. 1 John 5, verse 13, where we will see the purpose statement of this letter. Pastor John writes, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Why did he write? He wants this congregation to know that they have eternal life. He wants them to have assurance of their salvation. 
It's not uncommon for the purpose statement to be found at the end of a, of a letter or a book. In fact, he does the same thing at the end of the Gospel of John. Why don't you turn there quickly? End of the, end of the Gospel of John, chapter 20. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. John writes, therefore, many other signs Jesus also did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's the purpose of his gospel. Everything that he included within his gospel, the purpose for which he wrote it, is that by reading it, by hearing it read, you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and have life in his name. The reason for writing 1 John, his first letter, was to give the Christians assurance that they indeed are in the faith, but also to counter the false teachings of this divisive group. Concern for the church, which was navigating an increasingly confusing ecclesiastical environment, Pastor John writes to them to help them to determine and describe what is true Christianity. The pastor writes them this letter with the series of tests to counter the false teaching. Passing these tests will provide the true Christians with assurance of salvation. And as the early church received this letter, they would read it in its entirety, in one sitting, before the whole congregation. And that's exactly what we're going to do now. So turn back to 1 John. First John chapter 1, from verse 1 onwards. John writes, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we are writing so that our joy may be made complete. And this is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you, that God is is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. 
the one who says, I've come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly in him, the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness blinded his eyes. I'm writing to you, little children, because your sins have been forgiven, for, forgiven you for his name's sake. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have known him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I've written to you, children, because you have known the Father. I've written to you, fathers, because you have known him who has been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they were of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be manifested that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all, and you all know. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Everyone who denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that which you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise which He Himself made to us, eternal life. These things I've written to you about those who are trying to deceive you. And as for you, the anointing whom you received from him abides in you. And you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as he has taught you, abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him. So that when he is manifested, we may have confidence and not shrink away from, from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who does righteousness has been born of him. See how great a love the Father has given to us, that we would be called children of God, and we are. For this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, 
Now we are children of God, and it has not been manifested as, as yet what we will be. We know that when He is manifested, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Everyone who does sin also does lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He was manifested in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or has come to know Him. Little children, let no one deceive you. The one who does righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does sin is of the devil, because the devil sins from the beginning. The Son of God was manifested for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Everyone who has been born of God does not sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifested. Everyone who does not do righteousness is not of God, as well as the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the evil one and slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil. And his brothers were righteous. Do not marvel, brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. And by this we will know that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as He gave a commandment to us. And the one who keeps His commandment abides in Him, and He in Him. We know by this that He abides in us, by the Spirit whom He gave us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming, and now is already in the world. You are from God little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world hears them. We are from God. The one who knows God hears us. The one who, does not, the one who is not from God does not hear us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. 
By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has beheld God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. We have beheld and bear witness that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have come to know and have believed the love which God has in us. God is love. The one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love has been perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the one who gives new birth loves also the one who has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and do his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments, they're not burdensome. For everything that has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the overcoming that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with, it, with the blood. It is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that bear witness, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the witness of God is this, that He has borne witness about His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has this witness in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the witness which God has borne witness about his son. And the witness is this, that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have that life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence which we have before Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will for him give life to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make request for this. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who has been born of God sins. 
but he who, is, he who was begotten of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. This is the reading of God's holy and authoritative word. And we'll have the privilege over the next few weeks and months to study paragraph by paragraph, verse by verse, pericope by pericope, navigating, working through this tremendous letter. The Heidelberg Catechism of 1563 was composed in the city of Heidelberg, Germany. At the request of Elector Frederick III, who ruled the province of the Platinate from 1559 to 1576. This new catechism was intended as a tool for teaching young people, a guide for preaching in the provincial churches, and a form of confessional unity among several Protestant factions in the Platinate. The Synod of Dort approved the Heidelberg Catechism in 1619, and it soon became the most ecumenical, ecumenical of the Reformed Catechisms of, and Confessions. And this is what the Heidelberg Confession says. The first question, the first question in the Heidelberg Confession asks, what is your only comfort in life and death? What is your only comfort in life and death? The answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to Him. Christ, by His Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Indeed, assurance of salvation is the greatest reason why we have joy in this comfort. And that is why John wrote this first letter, so that you and I would have the joy of knowing that we indeed have eternal life. Let's pray. Father God, we are so humbled by your grace and your love towards us in Christ. Lord, indeed, we were your enemies. We were opposing your plan of redemption. We were vehemently hating your character and your glory. But in the kindness of God, you set your love upon us before the foundation of the earth. You called us to yourself with an effectual calling, resulting in regeneration by the work of your Spirit, so that we could become children of God, members of your household, placed within your body. Thank you so much for the Scriptures. Thank you so much for the New Testament and for First John. We are so excited about all that we will learn about you, Christ. We want to know more of you, Lord Jesus. And we are so excited to learn more about practical Christianity, our ethical responsibilities, our life of obedience to you out of a heart that is just so grateful, that is just so full of love for you 
because of your great work of redemption and your mercy in imputing righteousness to us, fallen sinners. Thank you for making us alive. Thank you for granting us eternal life. And thank you for this letter which would strengthen our assurance of salvation where we can enjoy salvation in its fullest, where we can enjoy Christ in his fullest and the church, the community of believers characterized by love for you and love for one another. Oh, how we long for Livingstone Bible Church to be this kind of church. Please, Father, accomplish that by your grace and for your glory. It's in your name that we pray these things. Amen.